one's ever asked me that before. Shout out to whoever wrote this because I was like, what is my answer? <laughs> what else do I prefer here versus in Australia? Oh, I prefer it. Are you still working at MBB? The next question is all about making friends in London. So like there's, honestly, this was the most asked question. All right. Hello and welcome. <laughs> I am doing a Q&A. I haven't ever done one of these videos. I've never kind of sat down properly and introduced myself, nor have I ever asked um, or answered your questions. So this is what we're doing here today. And this is it. <laughs> this is the thing. Oh, but before I get into the questions, I just wanted to take a moment to thank you all for either subscribing or watching this video. Thank you to everyone who asked a question. I really appreciate it. And I'm so glad that, I don't know, I feel like these questions reflect the type of community I would love to see here on this corner of the internet, but ultimately just, yeah, sending out big hugs, big love to everyone watching. And thank you so much for being here. Okay, so let's do it. <laughs> First question. Favorite book you read in 2023? Okay, so straight up, that's a great question. I love reading. Um, I just think books are like the cheapest form of education, like for 20 bucks or I guess 10 pounds, you can get this completely new perspective that you might have otherwise never have gotten because like, you know, those people aren't in your circle, aren't in your life, aren't in like your physical location. And I feel through books, yeah, you can just expand your perspectives. So my favorite book I read in 2023, there's three. The first was The Rachel Incident by Caroline O'Donoghue. I picked this up because I love Sentimental Garbage, the podcast that she hosts, particularly because of like the four hour episode where they rank all of the guys in Gilmore Girls. I'm a big Gilmore Girls fan. So obviously just listening to that was so nostalgic. The detail they went into was amazing. And that's why I picked up this book. At first, when I was reading it, I wasn't loving it but I persevered because it was like interesting enough and it wouldn't have been my favorite book when I finished it. It became my favorite book a few weeks later when it just like wouldn't leave my mind. Like I kept thinking about it all the time. And ultimately I think like that's a really good mark of a great book because obviously whatever the lessons were in that book stuck with me. And I think like one of the biggest ideas that that book covers is I guess just contextualizing the main character and the society she lives in and how she makes choices and as a reader you totally second guess all of those choices and are like why would you do that and you realize later that like she had to make those choices in the context of the year she was living in the society she was living in the community the culture the religious and political laws that she was living in and yeah i just really yeah it stuck with me which is why it's one of my favorite books of 2023 i will add two more to that list but i won't go into as much detail my other favorite book that I read in 2023 was, of course, Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow uh, by Gabrielle Zevin. That was just profoundly incredible. I know everyone else has spoken about it so highly, and I must admit it lives up to the hype. And then the third book was The Things We Do to Our Friends by Heather Darwent. This I don't think I should have liked. It was an unreliable narrator. The characters were awful. There were strong themes of narcissism but I was kind of addicted to reading it. I wanted to know what was happening. I wanted to understand who to believe. And I just thought it was just so beautifully written. What's been your highlight of 2023? Last year, I think what I did for myself was that I really prioritized rest and my health, which was, yeah, really nice. <laughs> it's a nice thing to do. I feel from like the doctors I was able to get access to and help from through to changes in my job and lifestyle. I just really prioritized kind of like a new stage and what I needed. Other things I really liked about 2023, um, I went on a lots of adventures and I got to go on those adventures with friends and family, which was definitely a highlight. I think also in saying that last year, I prioritized more travel that was like one week in one spot. You got to sit around, read books, relax, and then also active holidays as well. So like hiking and cycling and going after adventures that were more reflective of what I wanted now instead of just like continuing to, to travel. 
um, how I had previously. Are you still living in London slash what's your living situation? I am still in London. I am still living in the same flat and yeah, prices have gone up. Cost of living has gone up. We will see when <laughs> the new rental year comes around, if we can afford what the landlord might ask for and then who knows where we will be living. But for now, still in London, still in the same flat from like my apartment hunting video. How long are you guys staying in London for? Are you feeling settled now? Great question. The answer is I don't know for how long we're staying here. The question to feeling settled now is definitely. <laughs> definitely took, I think, a year to get settled. And now that we're well into the second year, it is much more easy. <laughs> we have our routines, we have our friends, we have the things we like to do, we have the things we like to eat, we have the places we like to go. We have our little like world here. And yeah, we're definitely feeling settled now. All right, what's the next question? Now that you've been in the UK a while, what things do you prefer there versus in Australia? Yeah, I feel like kind of comparing it makes living here difficult. Like, I guess we did that in the first six months to a year. We would compare everything like, oh, this is this in Sydney. This is this in London. And that comparison probably wasn't super helpful, to be honest. I think it made us either miss Australia more or or whatever, I don't know. But if I did have to compare, I would say that the lifestyle in Australia is potentially better. You know, that whole kind of, I guess also I lived in Sydney, so that more beach vibe, uh, go for a swim after work, uh, exercise in the morning, get brunch with people, like that kind of lifestyle. But then the positives of London is knowing that you're going to kind of find yourself in this melting pot of humans and you're going to get all of these different perspectives. You're going to meet all these other people who are maybe on similar journeys to you. Like if they're choosing to come and live in this city, you might have a bit more in common, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, food is better in Australia, much fresher, much more healthy, much tastier in my opinion. <laughs> UK food is pretty bland. What else do I prefer here versus in Australia? Oh, I prefer its proximity to Europe. Uh, and just the rest of the world, like New York's what, nine or 10 hour flight away. Italy's a two hour flight away. Ooh, the proximity to Europe and the US and, and many other places is much better than in Australia. Of course, in Australia, we get better proximity to Asia. So pros and cons, but I've traveled a lot of Asia previously. So it's nice to be so close to Europe. But yeah, I say all of this uh, with equal love for both places. I went back to Sydney over the Christmas break and I loved being back there. It's it's beautiful. I think Sydney's beautiful and I think London has been a really fun ride too. Is London life what you expected? How is it? How is the process of life going in London? And thank you for sharing your journey, it says. Oh, thank you for watching. Uh, London life's been good. I feel very lucky for what our London life has been. I think we've found a lot of really authentic and genuine friendships here. I think we've found a lot of like-minded people who have been interested in doing similar things to us and therefore we just have these these humans who we get along with so well and can go on adventures with. I'm really happy with where we've chosen to kind of base ourselves in London. I feel very at home but also very inspired by the area we live in. And in terms of like expectations, like I didn't have too many expectations, but I definitely had the assumption that working in London, especially in like the design and creative field that uh, both Liam and I work in, I definitely thought it would kind of be like from zero to a hundred. Um, and I would say it hasn't been that. I think Australia, uh, Sydney, Melbourne probably as well. Like the type of clients that are coming into Australian businesses and creative industries are really high caliber. And therefore I don't think I needed necessarily to move to find bigger and better projects or anything like that. I think I have found that as well, but like when it comes to expectations, I think Sydney and the creative industries are quite competitive, broadly speaking. That said, I, I get to work with sick clients here. Expectations, What I, I don't think I had many other expectations other than like, maybe I thought, <laughs> that walking around London would be like those YouTube videos where it's like, what people in New York are wearing? What people in London are wearing? And there would just be like these 
crazy chaotic larger than life characters and there certainly are a few of those but it's not the norm for those characters to just be out and about doing guerrilla fashion shows or anything like that i think that was media and kind of like tv shows making me expect that but that is not the case <laughs> at all sounds kind of silly now that i think about it has moving overseas been beneficial for personal growth and or career so yeah that's a great question i really like that question because i think you have to wonder why are you moving overseas it's certainly not easy it's certainly not cheap it certainly takes a toll on like your physical mental health it takes a toll on your relationships back home yeah it's not easy so you have to like wonder what is like the benefit i didn't even know what the benefit was going to be it was just always something i knew i was going to do it was kind of like a non-negotiable where i knew I was going to do it in my 20s. So if you're like that, I think you're gonna end up doing it. <laughs> so you may as well do it. So with that said, I guess what have been the benefits? Uh, personally, just like your world expanding, like you leaving your bubble, especially if you've kind of lived in the same place for the whole time. It, yeah, it just opens your mind, expands your worldview, uh, pops that bubble that you might be living in. I feel like you can get caught up in a lot of the realities of, of where you kind of grown up, where you've lived your life. And then you come here, you're quite literally, and by here, I mean, you go abroad and you're quite literally a nobody. <laughs> nobody knows you, you have no connections, you're completely isolated, everything is new. Um, it's a huge learning curve and I think that like, how can you not grow in that context? So the growth is huge. And I would say all of that growth is beneficial because it's going to make you stronger, uh, make you more confident. It's going to help you have new perspectives on the world. And yeah, just generally, it's a good time. Also, interestingly, like another benefit was this YouTube channel. I feel like if I hadn't have moved overseas, I wouldn't have felt like an impetus to, to create it. And so with this move came this channel, which has brought me huge personal growth in terms of uh, deep reflection on myself, what I do, how I speak, what I say, what I wear, like just um, trying to let go of all these expectations of myself. That obviously came as a result of moving overseas. For me, it was this channel, who knows what it might be for someone else, like what their growth journey looks like and what they might latch on to and do by the opportunity to, to move overseas. And obviously career growth, I touched on in the previous question. I feel like potentially uh, the creative industries in Australia are really strong. I think I'll see those benefits later in life. <laughs> Ooh, this is a cool one. What are your go-to stores for homewares? Okay, I love that question. I love homewares. Literally bought a new rug today. Go-to stores for homewares. Uh, Goodhood, that's in East London. Lots of beautiful things. While you're near there, drop into Earl of East. While you're near Earl of East, also drop into Labour and Wait. That is the most gorgeous little store with beautiful little things. It's also uh, independently owned, so you're supporting local, which is brilliant. Um, and clothing they obviously sell nice clothes but they also have a huge like homewares and lifestyle section on their website we purchase a lot of stuff from there whenever they have a sale nordic nest when we first arrived we used that a lot nordic nest has some really nice brands of course facebook marketplace and ebay um, on that train of thought also another store online is called vinteria which is for like vintage furniture Wait, vintage is for the clothes. Vinteria is for vintage furniture. <laughs> Confusing. Um, also, I think just markets and shops in general all across London, there are so many. I really couldn't list them and also I haven't been to all of them, but there's things like, you know, ceramics markets, you might see a flyer for. You'll also find a lot by just like walking past them. Like the other day uh, on my January vlog, you'll see we walked past house uh, near Victoria Park, dropped in, beautiful things. Now it's like saved onto my Google Maps. And I think just like over time, you'll build up that list. But those are just a few of my recommendations. What is your favorite place you've traveled? Best travel memory? Favorite place you visited in Europe? Okay, very similar questions. I can see how I grouped them together. And that answer is so easy. Iceland. 
Ah, I loved Iceland. We had the absolute best time in Iceland. Definitely go see my vlog if you haven't watched that. It's also one of my favorites, but obviously also volcanoes are literally erupting there. So I don't know what the situation is for travel right now or what it might look like in the future, but easy answer. <laughs> Okay, next question is, how do you look after yourself, self-care, etc.? Oh, this is a nice question. Oh, no one's ever asked me that before. Oh, this is so nice. How do I look after myself? Okay, exercise, number one. And exercise regularly, I completely count a 30 minute walk as exercise. So yeah, just about moving the body really. Uh, for me, it used to be yoga. I used to practice yoga daily. Uh, more recently, it's been spinning, like spin classes. I'll do that like four times a week. Um, social netball I've been playing as well. Pickleball we're gonna be getting into. So yeah, just regular exercise is number one priority. Um, and definitely not looking at exercise through the lens of physicality, but looking at it through the lens of like dopamine and accessing the dopamine. Uh, another thing I do is sleep. I take my sleep very seriously. Uh, I definitely don't mess around with my sleep. I am pretty stringent on like getting home and having a good night's sleep. I'll always prioritize a sleep over like a wild night out, but also like given where I am in my life stage, that's a pretty easy <laughs> prioritization. Uh, I guess it depends where you are in your life. I also limit and like kind of manage like alcohol in terms of I know how much I can have to enjoy myself and I know how much if I have, I feel quite ill. Yeah, I definitely try to limit my alcohol consumption and that really helps with my like taking care of myself. What else, what else, what else? Reading, I read instead of social media scrolling. So I have my Kindle next to my bed and I, love to read I'll just read 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 instead of like even instead of reading kind of like articles online just um to give myself a break from my phone I prefer to be reading on on my kindle oh yeah I also limit like my social media so I haven't had Instagram I think in like I think I quit Instagram five years ago or something like that and that whew, that was the biggest one my care of myself <laughs> went through the roof after I quit Instagram. And then since then, I also like just don't have um, social media like apps on my phone either. Where do you get your creative inspiration from, especially in the early stages of a project? Oh my God, killer question. Shout out to whoever asked that. So like if you work in a creative field, I deeply believe that like your experience of the world is first and foremost like your biggest indicator of research and is like part of your work it's not that like you go to work you do your creative work <laughs> and then you go home and you live a completely different life like i believe that everything you're doing all the time are contributing to your creative process and your creative inspiration so I would just like first and foremost caveat that I believe like everything I'm doing all the time is adding up and helping me get my creative inspiration. With that said, I would say definitely like consider the podcasts you're listening to. Are they bringing you creative inspiration later down the line? Are the books that you're reading sparking thoughts and creative ideas in your mind? Um, another thing is like sub stacks. Like I read a few really selective sub stacks that always make me ponder certain things so that's the first port of call and then the second is talking to friends and family whenever i have a brief i always find mulling it over with friends and family has always helped with a lot of the creative inspiration even if it's the smallest thing like you mentioned oh i've got a brief about xyz and then someone's like oh yeah like i saw something the other day that's similar to that and then like all of a sudden you're going down like a rabbit warren of new ideas so that first route is much more passive and the second route is to be much more active and begin like secondary research so i'll always go on to um uh, uh, this old thing called google and like google everything and anything like all different kinds of weird combinations 
combinations of words as well related to the topic that I'm like researching. But I also have a lot of like go-to sites saved in my bookmarks that like I'll quickly turn to. So the first is kind of like things behind paywall, like uh, the future laboratory, trend watching. Uh, then the next is kind of like journalism and articles. So always we'll go to like Forbes, HBR, Fast Company, New York Times, Refinery29. And then I also have a bookmark category that's like very specific to design and creativity, like um, Dazine, It's Nice That, Super Future, Dazed and Confused, Creative Boom, Arc Daily. So those are a lot of like sites that I'll turn to and I'll embrace the rabbit holes that they take me down. Uh, so that's like the more active secondary research, um, but then also active primary research. So this is where you have specific questions you want to follow up with people, ask them for a five minute chat and you just like low key quiz them on it to understand like what their experience was and all of that can be helpful inspiration and fodder for your creative process. And obviously you can take it further than just like a few individuals and you can send out like a Google form. Obviously on a project, if you have budget, uh, you can definitely go much wider, much bigger, get like a thousand person survey sent out. Okay, this is, I think I'm taking too long answering these questions. Okay, next question is any plans for upcoming travels in 2024? Yes, I'm going on a cycle trip in Norway. Hopefully if we can get that all organized. I have uh, one of my best friends coming over to Italy. So I'm gonna go uh, to Sorrento with her. The next question is all about making friends in London. So like there's, honestly, this was the most asked question. And I feel by the amount of people who ask this question, it's 100% one of like the biggest needs, desires, um, I definitely feel the same. I guess I wanna preface this question with the fact that many people have asked this. I hope that you feel validated that it is a common experience for people and that you're not alone. Unfortunately, like the, the most successful friends I found were through YouTube. So maybe look into your socials, start a YouTube channel, and that's how you can find friends in a new city. The end. Um, no, that's not very helpful. The other thing that worked was weirdly Facebook groups. So there's quite a few. I joined London Lonely Girls Club and on there I kind of just waited until I saw people uh, post about themselves that like kind of really connected with me and then I would message them to meet up. So I did meet a few friends through that at the beginning. Um, the second is a new and recent discovery. So we recently joined a social netball uh, group in like our local area. And I think that is a really good way to meet people. We're, we're 18 months in and as soon as we did it, we're like, why didn't we do this the first month that we arrived here? Because essentially most people in the team have like joined as individuals or at most like two to three people and they are all doing it for the same reason. They wanna be social, they wanna be active. So already you have those values in common. And yeah, everyone's been like super keen to hang out. And I think that's a really good way. So obviously we joined netball because we used to like play social netball in Australia, but there's like social basketball, volleyball. I don't know, there's probably many other sports. And then work, I've also made friends through work. So those are probably the three main avenues. Um, and then I guess when like a final tip on that friendship thing is, although everyone is looking for friends, I think it's important to find like the right type of friends and the right community for you. And so I think be prepared that a lot of friends or, or I guess people that you'll meet won't necessarily become your community or your friends because you know, it has to, both people have to be vibing. And so if those friendships don't eventuate, um, it's definitely not you. It's just that the two of you um, weren't necessarily meant to be friends. And I think it's worth like just trying again to find the right type of friends here because it's a big city, it's a melting pot of humans, and I think you can certainly, over time, find the people that bring you a lot of joy. Okay, next question is, how do you decide what area to live in in London? Now that's a great question, because London is huge. It's like all these tiny cities <laughs> coming together 
to make up London. So many different areas and honestly a lot of them do have very different vibes. Okay so how we got an initial idea before moving here physically was that we asked people that we knew who had already lived in London kind of like what area they kind of thought we might enjoy. Uh, we heard Shoreditch a lot but then when we did get here we 100% spent the first few days really going hard on experiencing the different areas so we were pretty confident that we wanted to live east but we like went to the west just to see what that was like um, then we were pretty interested also we thought like southeast might work so we spent a day walking around that area and we did really like the parks and we did like that area. Ultimately though, when we compared it to how we felt when we walked around kind of, uh, I guess from Dalston through to like London Fields over to Victoria Park, that is how we decided where to live. So I'd recommend doing as much research as possible that you can before getting here, but ultimately just setting aside a proper amount of time and a solid few days to go and explore different areas of London and make sure that where you're choosing is right for you. How do you get the most out of travel when living in London? Okay, this is an interesting question, only because I don't fully know the answer. <laughs> Because when we first arrived and in our first year, we did heaps of weekenders. That's like kind of how we assumed you would get the most out of travel, like make use of the weekends. But it didn't work because we went to places so quickly that we couldn't really immerse in them. And we were so tired during the work week from having traveled all weekend. I don't know how to get the most out of traveling in London because I don't think it's weekenders <laughs> um, unless you have boundless energy in which case good for you okay next question is hello i'm a recent master's graduate in service design who has returned to latin america where service design is not yet established i understand this may not have been your situation but how would you carve out a space for yourself in the market when there isn't one yet i'm so glad someone asked that i feel like because originally i made this channel with the intention of promoting strategic design or design strategy because obviously i came from a background of design but i worked within strategy teams at like both consultancies and creative agencies so i always felt like this in between where i was like a little bit design but not design enough to be like on Figma and a little bit strategy, but not enough strategy to be on Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> and so I kind of wanted to carve this space for myself to be like this like more creative or designer strategist. So honestly, like how I personally created space for that, a lot of advocating for myself. I feel I was confident enough because I had the skills, I'd studied design, I worked in a really um, like great strategy consultancy in my first job, so I learned a lot about strategy so i felt like i had the chops to back up kind of what i could do after i'd advocated for myself so hard to get put on a project as like a design strategist i then made sure to prove myself and so i think i probably worked really 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 hard on quite a few projects but after i'd proved myself i then was seen as that type of like skill set and i was put on projects for that skill set, and we started even winning work and pitching for work that the agency I worked at wouldn't have normally pitched for because they now saw the new skill that I was able to bring. I'm wishing you luck with that process, and I hope you, yeah, have the confidence to believe in yourself. And you know, I'll be believing in you over here. <laughs> okay, the next question is: Which pottery studio did you used to go to, and are you still doing any pottery at the moment? Ah! Thanks so much for asking. I really like doing pottery. So I can share that the studio I was going to is called uh, Tokobo Pottery Studio. And I am still doing pottery. I go on and off, but I definitely enjoy the process. It's beautiful to mold clay. And then to know if you like destroy the clay, it will just get remolded again by someone else. Like I think that's so poetic. <laughs> I'm moving to London in a month. Any general tips on surviving cold, dark winters? Um, the only answer I have is to embrace them. <laughs> so our first winter here was very difficult. We were not in any way prepared. Our second winter has been very different. It's been really nice. And I think it's just having gone through it and knowing what to expect. But the ways that I was more prepared was A, 
I bought proper winter gear. Turns out all the Australian winter gear I owned was for not actually cold climates. <laughs> and then the other thing I did was I really got into uh, like huga, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I read like the little book of huga and tried to like learn what being huga is like or being hoogly, I think is what it's called. And things like that for me looked like buying a lot of candles and lighting them regularly, not being a stinge on the candles, like just having that beautiful soft light to um, embrace the, the darkness. Um, always having a hot water bottle on hand, getting one that really makes you excited to kind of fill up and just have that nearby to get cozy, um, embracing cozy cooking. So really getting in, into making soups and stews, Okay, so the next question is, oh, still got like three more. Oh my God, it's four. Okay, I'm really taking my time, I'm sorry. I found your channel through your first day vlog. Are you still working at MBB or have you moved on? Why have you decided to stay or leave? I'm sure other people might be curious as well. I think I hinted to it at the beginning of this, but I have moved on. I, I might end up making like a whole other video going into that because there is a lot to unpack, but I definitely have no regrets. Um, yeah, it just wasn't the right fit for me. There were obviously like a lot of perks with that type of job, but ultimately the culture of a big organization like that and kind of the system it operates in, such as like the hierarchical partner mode and, and things like that, it was just not for me. Uh, I did not vibe it. Was it easy for you to find work in London? If yes, can you share your experience with us? At the time when I looked, I think it was, so maybe yes. I also had built up enough of a career in Australia that I wasn't moving over to London as like a fresh junior. And I think that definitely helped me. But in saying that, we also were looking back in like 2021 maybe. Wow, that's ages ago. Versus when I went to get a new job and leave the MBB role, it wasn't as easy. I think the market was much more competitive. And I'm not sure if like London all of a sudden became more competitive because obviously borders opened up compared to 2021. Probably, that would probably be the reason. In terms of my process, when I was looking in Australia, I just kind of went on LinkedIn. I followed the brands and companies I'm, I'm, I'm keen on. I applied for roles when I saw them. Did the interview process, that was quite interesting because my interviews were at like 10 or 11 p.m. Australia time with the time difference. Uh, I think I had like five, maybe six interviews for this company that I worked for, but they have quite a rigorous um, hiring process. Uh, then I got offered the role, signed the contract, and then I made plans to move. Is London your final spot on earth to live? If not, which places would you consider trying? Oof, good question. No, <laughs> it's not my last spot on earth. It's a good spot though, it's okay. Uh, where else would I try? Copenhagen. I really liked Copenhagen when I went there. I haven't been to New York City. I would be open to trying it, but the States are not really selling themselves to me right now. I don't know, there's lots of places to live, right? Like Tokyo would be nice too. Yeah, I don't know. It was pretty hard moving though. Would I want to do it again? <laughs> Eek. Have you ever been to Manchester? The answer is yes but it was a long time ago. Okay, next question is all about restaurants in London. So to like, kind of like answer that, I've split this between like maybe the, the slightly more affordable in saying that like nothing's affordable in London restaurants and definitely like the less affordable, like date night or something like that, like money. And date night with yourself as well, by the way, not just romantic date night, friend date night too. Also caveat that a lot of these are in the East. More affordable places, like my favorite pubs are De Beauvoir Arms and the Lady Mild May. They are both owned by like the same group. So the food is quite similar at both of them, but I find it really fresh, tasty. Also the Prince Arthur, really tasty food as well. That was actually where we had our first Sunday roast. When we moved to London, our lovely friend Eve organized it. Um, another is Lahore one that is very tasty Indian food. And I, I can't say I found that one. My friend uh, recommended it. Uh, he said he travels all the way from the West just to eat there. And then another is a noodles um, joint that I 
don't want to butcher the name of, so I'll put it on the screen here. But damn, those are tasty noodles. That's really good. For lunch, Layla's shop, that food is tasty. Um, also, Oren Deli at Broadway Market is a really good hack because obviously they've got Oren the restaurant, which is like quite pricey, but they make equally as tasty food at Oren Deli for like way cheaper. For all the brunch people out there, uh, the one and only brunch spot in London that you must go to is Esther's in Stoke Newington. That's tasty brunch and I will die on that hill. Then on the more spenny side, we've got Little Duck. We love Little Duck. The interiors are so cottage core. It's such a vibe. The food is obviously also really good. We also love Rochelle Canteen. That food's really fresh. It's also kind of in a inside outside type of situation. So when you're in London and it's all like yeah, city everywhere, Rochelle Canteen is like in this beautiful serene garden and it's just so peaceful. Um, and then also the Baring, which I had in my January vlog, that's tasty. In your recent video, you mentioned you were writing some articles as part of your job. Could you share insights into your criteria for choosing a specific type of article? Thank you so much for watching that vlog and for this follow-up question. Yeah, sometimes with work, it's a mix. It can either be self-initiated, so you've like noticed a trend, maybe you've read a report and you're like, damn, that's really interesting. I wanna write more about that or I wanna do more research. But then the other route is like your company or your work has really noticed a trend. So anyone heard of AI? That's like a big trend. And so companies wanna talk about that. And so like, that's kind of like the angle you go down. You can pick your own lens to put on it. Uh, ultimately though, I would just recommend start writing. Uh, my old boss used to get me to just like write a bunch of articles that were never going to be published just to encourage me to find my voice, to figure out how I wanted to sound in articles. So yeah, I would say the same advice to you. Just start writing it, even if it doesn't get published, even if like none of the facts are true. It's more just the, the exercise of figuring out what your writing style is. Is there something specific you would like to achieve with your social media presence or is it just a fun way to capture life? Shout out to whoever wrote this because I was like, what is my answer? <laughs> what do I wanna get out of this? <laughs> Obviously I, I, I took a break from YouTube and then I came back. So something obviously drove me to come back. One of the main drivers was not just documenting my life, but connecting with family from back home. Like I know my mom watches all of these vlogs. Hi mom. And yeah, those things mean a lot to me to know that in, ma in making these vlogs, I feel closer to my family that are so far away. So that's definitely one reason of why I came back. And obviously like this isn't a source of income for me. <laughs> I have my full-time job slash career. I think I get like 50 pounds from YouTube each month. <laughs> like it's, um, it's not a whole lot. Uh, it's not nothing, but it's definitely not enough to pay the bills. So therefore, I feel like there has to be something bigger than than doing it for, for I guess, like economic reasons. Um, and then I definitely, I think like long term, there's something really nice about like the independence of making this for myself, like filming it myself, choosing what I do, like, my job is so often about my clients work and this is just this is my little world my little corner of the internet okay lucky last question um thank you so much if you've watched through to the end i'm assuming this is going to be a very long video because i have rambled um okay last question <laughs> would you be willing to ever do a london meetup or go get coffee if a subscriber of yours would be in london and would love to meet up I think a meetup could definitely be cute in London. Like that could be really nice actually. If you were interested, maybe leave a comment or something. And maybe if there's like enough people, we could organize it. Um, but definitely like feel free to reach out and just like drop me a line or like who you are or like what you like to get out of the catch up as well. And I'm, I'm definitely not like closing that door off at all. Um, but yeah, okay. That was fun. Whew. Uh, but thank you so much for being here. Thank you for watching this video. Thank you for subscribing. If you do, if you don't, please feel free to if it's a vibe. And otherwise, uh, I hope you have a lovely day, night, wherever you are. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye.